Thanks very much. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about uh, the quality of life and living standards um, results as well as employment and <coughs> income. So in terms of quality of life and living standards, um, consistent with findings in other parts of the world is that people with disabilities are far less likely to report emotional well-being, life satisfaction, positive life satisfaction and, and a sense of economic prosperity. These outcomes, because what we were doing in the analysis is to say how much of this is explained by disability and how much of it is explained by other factors. And of course, quality of life is something that's very difficult to pin down what influences it because there's so many variables. So we found that in addition to disability, these um, outcomes were strongly predicted by age and income. And of course, people with disabilities in the, popular, in the sample were older and had lower levels of income, <coughs> as well as a range of other unidentified individual level variables, such as your resilience, your approach to life. So in terms of well-being, um, or in terms of um, yeah, well-being, people with disabilities were less likely to, um, oh, sorry, we've discussed this one. Uh, in terms of living standards, there were no differences in access to basic services between households that included a person with disabilities and those that did not. And that's something to be expected because of the way that basic services have been rolled out in communities. It's a wide-ranging, broad intervention that the government has invested in, and that means that it targets everybody. So people should not be left out of um, receiving those basic services. So it has benefited most people, including people with disabilities. That's not to say that there are not pockets where basic services are not um, reaching the people they need to be reaching, particularly in rural areas, and we found that in the Lilydale um, case study. Um, but by and large, what we're seeing is that basic services are doing what they're supposed to be doing, which is, a, is very positive. We looked at social capital as well in term, when we were looking at quality of life and well-being. And what we found consistent with our finding in the Johannesburg Poverty and Disability Study, is that people with disabilities tend to have very strong household networks of support. As Jackie mentioned earlier, we found that more people with disabilities indicated that they were married or living with a partner than the non-disabled um, sample. Households in which a person with disabilities was living were, were on average larger than those without <coughs> people with disabilities, and that is probably because people with um, impairments or, and, and of course when we're talking about the older um, population are tending to live together to provide those networks of support. There's research that's been done about the role of the, the disability grant and the old age pension in terms of supporting families and people congregating around those households. So the support of the family or household is very important for people with disabilities and in many cases replaces um, minimal or absent government level services um, from, from the states and from as well as from other organizations where organizations are not able to reach people with disabilities. The care happens in the household and the support happens in the household. And that often largely goes undocumented, unsupported, um, and, and the effects of that on people within the household is something that's not really understood and an area for further, for, for further research. In what ways can people be supported? Of course, the work of community-based rehabilitation workers is incredibly important in providing that support, and we need to understand what the extent to which that is happening. It's important, though, to acknowledge that the relationship is not unidirectional. It's not that people with disabilities are being supported by other family members. It's bi-directional. Um, people with disabilities were contributing very positively in the household. Interestingly, we found that people with disabilities were more likely to report being the head of the household or the main or joint decision maker in the household. That's probably also related to age. Um, and also the, the receipt of the disability grant and other, um, other ways in which people with disabilities engage in the household provided support within the household. In terms of employment and labour market participation, I guess we can 
guess at what the, the results were, but the, the findings give you the, the evidence for what we, what we already know. What we see in the, in the graph here is that fewer people with disabilities than non-disabled people are unemployed. See, 15% of people with disabilities indicated being unemployed, as opposed to 21% of people who, were, um, who, who did not have disabilities. That is explained by the high number of people with disabilities who count themselves as being not economically active. Now bear in mind that this analysis is done of the working age population, so it doesn't include people who would be um, already on the old age pension. Um, so we're still, you know, even if when we exclude that group, we still see that people with disabilities are far more likely to report being not economically active. And some of that, that is because of severe impairments, but a larger portion of that is explained by people who feel that because they have a disability, they're not able to find work um, or appropriate work and therefore opt out of the labor market. Um, for people with disabilities, the, the challenge of finding employment remains over time. So as Jackie mentioned, this is a panel study, it's a longitudinal study, and we tracked people over two waves of data. We found that people without disabilities were more likely in the time that uh, had lapsed between um, waves to have found employment to have found employment than people with disabilities. So it indicates the inequalities that are still very profound in the labour market. In terms of types of employment, so now we look at the people with dis uh, the people who had indicated that they were employed. What we find is that people with disabilities were far more likely to be insecurely employed. So they didn't have written contracts, uh, their employers were not making UIF contributions, indicating that they're in a very vulnerable position even when they are employed. They're also more likely than non-disabled people to work in their house in household businesses, and that, you know, as as I've spoken about when we were talking about social capital, is one of the many ways in which disabled people are working in the house. People with disabilities are contributing in household, which is positive. However, we do need to recognise the risks of people being unpaid or underpaid or undervalued for the work that they are doing in, in household businesses. All of these findings have in, uh, implications for income inequality. Where people are insecurely employed, they're less likely to be earning the right kind of um, wage that they should be earning. Um, they don't have that kind of protection. And we see that income inequality coming through when we look at the income data. So, the, and then the inequalities in both income and in job security, even out at the upper end of the skill spectrum in the labor market. So in the data set, there were a few people, people with disabilities who indicated being in professional, uh, being professionals, and we don't see the same wage and um, security inequalities amongst that group of people. And that shows us that access to education, and particularly post-secondary education, is a very important intervention if we're going to correct some of the um, income and security inequalities in the labor market. So in terms of income, <coughs> what we found was that people with disabilities earn a median income from work of almost 400, le 400 rand less than non-disabled people. However, interestingly, disability was not a significant predictor of earnings from work. What we found played much more of a role was gender and race. So women are far more likely to earn less, quite a lot less than men in the labor market. And African people are earning a lot less than white people in the labor market. Now because our, dis our, our sample of people with disabilities has a high number of women and African people in the, in the sample, that explains these wage differentials that we're seeing between people with disabilities and non-disabled people. But it's very important for us to note that when we look at the changes over time, we see, very, we see slight positive changes in terms of the gender and race effects, suggesting that interventions in employment equity and affirmative action are beginning to close those income gaps for when we look at gender and race, very minimally, but it's still progress. 
we're not seeing the same effects when we look at um, people with disabilities. So employment, what we're seeing is that employment equity policies are not really doing what they're supposed to do for people with disabilities over time. The other form of income, of course, is from social protection mechanisms, from the grant system. And what we saw was that 10% of people with disabilities were receiving the, dis the disability grant. Um, don't be shocked by that. Um, it's also it's important that we recognize that a number of the people in the sample would have qualified for the old age pension as opposed to the disability grant or would have moved from the disability grant onto the old age pension. However, 49% of people with disabilities who should have been eligible for those grants by our criteria were receiving no grants. And that is um, partly explained by the the differences in how uh, disability is, is measured. As Jackie mentioned, we used self-reporting of disabilities in this study, and we are aware that with the disability grant, a medical practitioner has to diagnose before a person is eligible for a disability grant. So even though somebody might identify as having an impairment, that might not be diagnosed, and they might then be excluded from receiving the disability grant. Nevertheless, um, there are still barriers to people accessing the disability grant um, and the kind of interventions that we've seen with the child support grant in ensuring that, that almost 95% 90, of children who are eligible for the child support grant are now, now receiving it. Those kind of interventions need to be happening when we talk about the disability grant as well to ensure maximum coverage of people who qualify for the disability grant. 25% of the people in, the, in the, the sample were receiving the state pension of the, the people with disabilities. The grants have incredible poverty alleviating effects um, for people with disabilities. And this, I think, is quite a, a telling um, figure. What we see here is we look at um, a poverty line. We know that South Africa doesn't have a poverty line, but we use um, an economic measure called the foster Greer thorbeck poverty line. Um, it's, it's used by many economists, and that has an upper bound and a lower bound. So the lower bound is 502 rand per month, and this is deflated to 2008 figures. 502 rand per month, and then the upper bound is above a 924 rand per month. And what we find is that if we exclude income from the disability grant, um, we see that almost 80% of people with disabilities would be living below the lower bound of that poverty line, uh, which is quite shocking. However, when we add in the disability grant, that figure is reduced to just under 70%. When we add in all other grants, so they may be receiving a child support grant, or as we've mentioned, the state pension, or um, the care dependency grant if they're caring for children with disabilities, what we see then is that it's reduced to just over 40%. So you can see the incredible poverty alleviating effects of the grant system for people with disabilities. So where does this leave us? The key finding of the study was that disability intersect, intersects with a range of socioeconomic variables. What we found played the strongest roles was age, race, and gender. Um, and it results in particularly negative outcomes, including reduced levels of income, lower education levels, a lack of labor market participation, and lower levels of health care. This suggests that integrated approaches for addressing the needs of those living in poverty are essential in addressing the needs of people with disabilities too. And we see that when we look at the effects of interventions in basic services, as well as in education. When education is expanded to all, we see that it does meet, to some extent, the needs of people with disabilities and, and closes that education gap. When we extend basic services to all, it meets uh, you know, it, it ends up targeting people with disabilities. But it is also very necessary to ensure that people with disabilities are recognized as a particularly vulnerable group for a variety of reasons, and that in some cases, specific interventions are required. And Jackie's discussion of the challenges in the education sector are pertinent here, that extending basic education to everyone 
is an incredibly important mechanism, but there also needs to be investments in special needs education. This approach to policies and interventions will ensure that people with disabilities are not left behind the development curve. And what we're seeing with the labour market um, findings is that at the moment, and we'll track this over time, we are seeing that people are being left behind in the labour market. And we need to ensure that that doesn't happen. We, once again, just um, to add on to what Dr. Rowland said, we want to thank the uh, Australian Government Department of Foreign, Foreign Affairs and Trade for their financial support of this project. And I also just want to mention that uh, it was not just Jack, Jackie and myself who were involved in this. We had a really good research team. Eleanor Ross is, Professor Eleanor Ross is here, if you'll stick up your hand, was a core team member. Uh, Zenobia Ishmael is uh, doing her PhD now in uh, Manchester. She was very involved in the study. And our colleague, Dr. Edson Munsaka, who subsequently moved back to Zimbabwe. Um, as well as Margie Schneider, who is now down at UCT. So it was a, a group effort, and I just want to thank my colleagues for all of their, their input as well. <laughs>